on Barcelona. I'm really excited for that. this one. We are going to have how trivial. And the guest here of this panel is none other than a designer for Magic the Gathering. I want to hear a warm round of applause for Mark Rosewater. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay. Let's oh. try this again. How did I get? I got it. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome to How Trivial. Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to MagicCon. You guys having a good MagicCon? Okay, so last year at Magic 30 in Las Vegas, uh, I did a panel called Picture That, where I told 30 stories from 30 years of magic based on 30 different pictures that I had picked. Um, so when they asked me to speak again, I said that worked well. I'll, I'll do the same thing, except this time, instead of pictures, I'm using trivia. So let me explain. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask 30 trivia questions. They're going to be multiple choice. I'll give you guys a chance to guess. And then I'm going to tell a story. So the trivia is just for means for me to tell a story, but you guys will have a chance to guess and see if you can guess the trivia. Um, but secretly, it's just for me to tell stories. Sound good? OK, question number one. When Richard Garfield first made the Magic the Gathering trading card game, what did he call it? Fast Bond? Five magics, magic, or mana clash? What do you guys think the answer is? The correct answer is magic. OK, so let me explain. So Richard Garfield and his friend Mike Davis created a game called Robo Rally, and they wanted to sell it. So they went to Seattle, Washington uh, to talk to Wizards of the Coast, and in particular, to the very first CEO, Peter Ackeson. Now, at the time, um, Wizards of the Coast was a very small company. They just made role-playing games. Um, some of them were for other people. A few of them were primal order they'd made up themselves. Um, anyway, the problem with Robo Rally is it had too many components. Wizards of the Coast just wasn't big enough to make it. So Richard Garfield asked a very important question. OK, what, what can you make? What game can you make? So what Peter said was, I have a printing company that we print our stuff at. I have artists that I know from a local college. So what he said was, I need a card game that can be played in between role-playing sessions. So Richard Garfield thought about baseball cards. He collected baseball cards as a kid. Um, and he liked trading cards in general. And he came up with the idea of a trading card game. So what he did was he took another game he had made, which was called Five Magics, that was based on, um, influenced by Cosmic Encounter and a book called The Master of the Five Magics. And he had made a, a sort of a board game, and this was years ago. But Richard realized that he could take the framework of Five Magics to convert it into the very first trading card game. Now, that game, oh, and so he and Peter, uh, you know, he pitched it to Peter, Peter loved it, and then obviously Magic got made. Um, so when, P when Richard made the game, he called it Magic because that was the name of the game, just magic. But the lawyer said, you can't call a game magic. It's too broad a term. You couldn't trademark it. So they said they needed another name. So what happened was, when they first pitched magic, they called it Mana Clash. That's where Mana Clash comes from. Uh, so when they first pitched it as a public thing. But Richard and the playtesters never called it Mana Clash. They kept calling it magic. So finally, they said, this is crazy. We want it to be magic. So they went to the lawyers and said, how can we make this magic? What can we do? So the lawyer said, well, if you add something to the end, then maybe we could trademark it. So that's when they added the gathering. And so that's why it's Magic the Gathering. So they, they, so they could keep calling it magic. OK, question number two. What mechanic that came out later was first created to be the Azorius mechanic in Return to Ravnica? Was it Ascend? Was it Constellation? Was it Fabricate? Or was it Manifest? What do you guys think? 
Yell it out. What do you guys think? It was Constellation. Okay, so this is Return to Ravnica. Uh, Ken Nagel was the lead designer of that set. Uh, he came in second in the first great designer search. Um, so we were trying to figure out what the Azorius guild to do. So in, in the world, they control, they're the, you know, they control the laws and they're the judges and they really control, they, they set all the rules. So we said, well, magic does something where you set the rules, enchantments. And white and blue were the number one and two of making enchantments that set rules. So we thought it might be cool, you know, inspired by landfall success. Well, what if we care about enchantments entering the battlefield? The problem was, um, in a guild set, all the guilds have to play nicely together. So the white-blue guild has to play with the other white guild and the other blue guild. And enchantments as a theme just didn't blend well. It just didn't work. So we ended up saving Constellation uh, for Journey into Nyx. And instead, uh, in Return to Ravnica, we did Detain. Because uh, that, that fit the theme we needed a little bit better. Okay, question number three. Champions of Kamigawa was our first top-down block. What theme, which we later did, was the runner-up? Was it Egyptian mythology, Gothic horror, Greek mythology, or Norse mythology? What do you guys think? The answer is Egyptian mythology. So Magic's first expansion was Arabian Nights. That was our first top-down set. Uh, Richard designed it after you know, A Thousand and One Nights, the, the famous book, The Raven Nights. Uh, but anyway, Bill Rose, who at the time was the head designer, now he's the VP, uh, Senior Vice President of Magic, uh, he came up with the idea of doing a block that was top down. And so we made a giant list of all the things we could do, and we slowly narrowed them down until we got down to two choices, Japanese mythology or Egyptian mythology. Uh, and in the end, we chose to go with Japanese mythology, so Kamigawa was Japanese. Um, but, obviously, you know, we did Champions of Kamigawa with that, and then years later, we would finally do, Amenket would do our Egyptian mythology set. Okay, question number four. Which of these blue Urza Saga cards was completely redesigned after the art came in? Back to Basics, Morphling, Show and Tell, or Time Spiral? What's your guess? Okay, I, this one I heard. Morphling is correct. Okay, so here's what happened. Um, we wanted to, in Alpha, there was a card called Clone. Uh, and Clone was a really awesome card. Um, but uh, there's a, the, the comprehensive rules early on didn't like cloning. They didn't quite know what to do with it. So for a while, we banned Clone. You, we weren't allowed to make any cards that cloned. Um, but we got to Urza Saga. And we said, you know what? Cloning is awesome. This is crazy. We should just make clone. So the idea was that we were just going to add clone. So we were going to put clone in the set. Now, if you look at the art of clone, it's two creatures that look alike facing each other. Well, if you look at Morphling, that's basically what's going on. Although one of them has a tail. Um, so we were, this card was just supposed to be clone. That's all it was. It was going to be, we were bringing back clone. And then right before, after the art came in, but before we finalized the set, uh, the rules manager said, look, we can't make it work. There's no way cloning can work in magic. You can't do clone. And so what happened was we had this art and we had to make a card. So we're like, okay, it's a shapeshifter because there's two of them. Um, okay, maybe we'll let it change its size. That sounds shapeshifter-y. Um, maybe we'll let it fly if it wants to fly. We'll make it, you know, give it hexproof or an early version of hexproof. Um, we'll let it untap itself. So we'll just give it a lot of ability so it can kind of do what it wants to do. And then Morphling ended up being very powerful and a, a very popular card. But it was supposed to be cloned, so that, that's that. Okay, question number five. Which flavor text from Ravnica City of Guilds that I wrote was the top rated piece of flavor text in market research? Helldozer, sometimes you go to hell, and sometimes hell comes to you. Hex, when killing five just isn't enough. Last gasp, allow me a moment to catch your breath. Or sadistic auger mage, don't worry, I know the drill. Okay, so what do you guys think? Hex. It is not Hex, it is Helldozer. Hex was number two, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so early, in early magic, I used to do a lot of flavor text. 
Um, and actually, during the Weatherlight Saga, I wrote all of Karn's and Urtai's flavor texts. Um, nowadays, I mostly just do uh, the unsets, so I do do flavor texts in the unsets. Um, but anyway, uh, during Ravnica, one night, it was late at night, and we realized a lot of the art came in, so we decided we would look at the art. And then for fun, we played this little game, which I called um, Movie Previews, where we pretended like this was a movie, and we'd talk in the movie voice, you know, in a world. Um, and so I made up the, the flavor text for this card as a 100% a joke. You know, sometimes you go to hell, sometimes hell comes to you, just because I was trying to mimic how they do the movies. Um, but it ended up, they liked it and they put it on a card, much to my shock. Um, I also made the flavor text for Hex. Um, it's the two cards I did. Hex was, I thought it'd be funny if the flavor text was exactly six lines, six words long, because the, the card revolves around six. So anyway, these are the only two cards I made in the set. In the review, it was ranked number one and number two, a feat I will never repeat, uh, but I was very proud of that. <laughs> okay, question number six. Which of the following sets doesn't have the word teammate appear in the text box? Dungeons and Dragons, Inventions in the Forgotten Realms, Future Sight, uh, Oath of the Gatewatch, or Unglued? What's your guess? Okay, you guys seem all over on this one, although I heard the right answer. Uh, the correct answer is Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Adventures of the Forgotten Realm. So Unglued was the first uh, set to ever mention teammates. There was a cycle of cards that cared about multiplayer play. Uh, yet another thing the Unsets did before anybody else. Uh, in Future Sight, we were doing future shift of cards of playing in space we hadn't done yet. So there was one card, Imperial Mask, that actually referenced teammates in it. And then in Oath of the Gatewatch, the flavor of Oath of the Gatewatch was the Gatewatch came together. So we decided, uh, we played up two-headed giant in that set, and we actually made the surge mechanic care. It referenced team our teammates in the reminder text. Uh, but Dungeon Dragons, even though it's all about teaming up, their actual teammate wasn't, didn't appear in it. Okay, question number seven. Which Mirage card is directly responsible for me starting my trademark incomplete information preview teasers? Final Fortune, Lion's Eye Diamond, Morrow, or Phyrexian Dreadnought? What's your guess? They gotta be lives, I can hear you. So Dreadnought is the correct answer. So. Um, in Alpha, Richard Garfield made a card called Force of Nature. It was an 8-8. So in uh, Antiquities, they made Colossus of Sardia. It was a 9-9. Then in the Dark, they made Leviathan. It was a 10-10. Uh, and then in Ice Age, they made Polar Kraken. It was an 11-11. Uh, so we got to Mirage, and I saw the game we were playing. Uh, so I go to Bill Rose, who was the head designer, or sorry, the lead designer of Mirage. And I say to Bill, we got to make a 12-12. And Bill's like, look, I'm, I'm growing tired of this. We're not gonna keep doing this. He goes, we're not making a 12-12. And I go, come on, Bill. And he goes, okay, I'll make you a deal. If you can make a 12-12 that interests me, I'll consider putting in the set. So I came back and I said, how about this? It's a 12-12 for one mana, 12-12 uh, trampler for one mana. I mean, yes, you gotta sacrifice 12 power worth of creatures, but, um, and Bill liked it, so he put it in the set. Uh, so, back in the day, we used, uh, Magic used to make a magazine called The Duelist, and I had a column in it called Insider Trading. So in that uh, was the very first teaser I ever did. There's only, the, only four teasers in the first one. In fact, the four cards in the question were the four things I teased. Uh, but the thing that inspired it was a 12-12 trampler for one. That just it was too good to do, so that's how the teaser started. Okay, question number eight. Which mechanic's playtest name was Flash Dance of the Dead? Was it Aftermath? Was it Escape? Was it Jumpstart? Or was it Unearth? What you guys, guess out, guess yes? Okay, Unearth is correct. That was the answer I heard. Okay, so uh, Unearth was the thing. Back in Odyssey, uh, I used to, so back in the day, I used to run the feature matches at the Pro Tour. And I, I would play, I would watch a lot of matches. So the little game I would play is when one player got way behind, I would grant that player in my mind special abilities to see if they could catch up. And one of the abilities was letting them cast spells out of the graveyard. Um, but I thought it was a cool idea. So um, in Odyssey, I made um, the mechanic flashback. Uh, it, it went on instants and sorceries. Um, but I always liked the idea, I always asked myself, could it go on permanence? Could it go on creatures? 
Um, so in Alara, shards of Alara, we were working on the Grixis, uh, the Grixis shard, um, and it dawned on me. Uh, I actually wasn't on the mini team. I, I led the Esper mini team. I was on the Naya and um, Bant mini teams, but I wasn't even on the Grixis mini team. But they came up with a mechanic that wasn't working, and I said to the team, you know, I kind of made a mechanic based on flashback that is for creatures. So um, I took the word flash from flashback, and I took Dance of the Dead from one of my favorite reanimation spells, and so we made Flash Dance of the Dead. Uh, inspired, of course, by Flashdance, if she was a zombie. Okay, next question. Question number nine. Which set structure was based on an email sent by a designer from the meeting where they first learned the basic theme of the set? Was it The Brothers' War? Was it Ikoria Lair of Behemoths? Was it Call Time? Or was it Streets of New Capenna? I, I'm hearing Call Time. That is not correct. It was Streets of New Capenna. Um, so here's what happened. So early on, before we flesh things out, we do, uh, we do one piece of art that sort of um, matches the feel of the world. And this, this art is the one we made. And originally we called this Demon Mobster World. That was our nickname for it. Uh, and we didn't quite know what we were going to do with it, but we knew like, it's a world where demons run it. We, we didn't quite, and we had a 20s vibe. Um, but anyway, we have a meeting right now, it's called the Monday Magic Meeting, but back in the day, it was called the Tuesday Magic Meeting, back when it was on Tuesdays. Uh, and in the meeting, um, I, I think Bill was showing off the upcoming sets, but it was very, we hadn't really figured out what was going in them, just we had the general idea. And so he put this up and said, Demon Mobster World. So in that meeting, Mark Gottlieb, who's one of the designers, um, literally from his phone in that meeting, sent an email to Ken Troop, who's the VP of Magic, and said, here's my idea. Three color you know, um, arcs that are, uh, represent tropes of crime from pop culture. And he mapped it all out in this email and he sent it in. And Ken was so impressed, he put Mark on uh, and we made it. That, that's how it ended up being the set. And it all came from Mark's just being inspired in the meeting and sending him a text in the meeting or an email. Okay, number 10. Which onslaught block card had the playtest name Mr. Baby Cakes? Was it Exalted Angel? Was it Forgotten Ancient? Was it Goblin Pile Driver? Or was it Sliver Overlord? Okay, I heard a lot of answers. The correct answer is Forgotten Ancient. Okay, so Forgotten Ancient, why was it called Mr. Baby Cakes? Uh, that was the design name made by Alex Freeman, the designer of the mechanic. Now, some of you might say, who is Alex Freeman? There's no person who's ever worked at, at Wizards named Alex Freeman. Well, this was made during the very first You Make the Card. So the way You Make the Card worked, this is back in January 2002, is we asked the audience, they picked the color, they picked the card type, they picked everything about the card. We let them literally vote on every aspect of the card. Um, including how big it was, what it did. They made the mechanics, they did the names. Um, they even picked the artist. They picked the sketch of the artist. Um, they picked how we developed it. They picked the power toughness and the balance. And in the end, uh, Mark Tadine did the art um, and it ended up being uh, Forgotten Ancient. But Mr. Baby Cakes was the design name and for most of the thing, it, the very last thing we did was name it. So people were calling it Mr. Baby Cakes for a long time. So the audience got to experience what I experienced, where you use the design name for a long, long time, and you can't remember the real name because you use the design name for a long, long time. That's why a lot of people to the day still call it Mr. Baby Cakes. Uh, Crucible Worlds, Vanishing Memory, and Waste Not were the second, third, and fourth You Make the Card cards. Okay, question number 11. Which inclusion by the Alliance creative team made the design team rename all their playtest cards? Was it Carnivorous Insects? Purple Hippos? Sentient monkeys or zombie barbarians? I hear hippos. It was sentient monkeys. So the creative team decided it'd be fun to have smart monkeys in the set, which by the way, were in the set. Um, but the people who designed it were called the East Coast Playtafters. So this is a, a picture from very early magic. So Scaff Elias, Jim Lynn, Dave Petty, and Chris Page, um, they were so, I don't know, outraged by the idea that there were sentient monkeys that they took all the cards in the set and they renamed them. 
So like Force of Will was Monkey in the Middle. That was Force of Will's name. Uh, by the way, uh, in Unhinged, I made a card called Monkey, 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 which was me making fun of that story. So if you never knew the origin of Monkey, 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 that's where it came from. Okay, question number 12. Which Scars of Mirrored and Black mechanic started as a single card? Was it Infect? Was it Living Weapon? Was it Metal Craft? Or was it Proliferate? It was Proliferate. You guys got that one right. Okay, so in Scars of Mirrodin, um, basically we had set this up. In original Mirrodin, we hinted that the Frexians were there, but pretty subtly. Uh, and then we came back, we saw the Frexians were there uh, doing not so good things to, uh, to Mirrodin. Um, and so we had this idea that the, I really like the Frexians as disease metaphor. And so I made a card called In Infection Spreader. So Infection Spreader, uh, when it entered the battlefield, if, if they had a poison, you gave an extra poison to the player, and any creature that had a minus one, minus one counter of your opponents, you put on a minus one, minus one counter. I so like how it played, I moved it to common and made an uncommon of it. And then I'm like, if I'm going to have a common and uncommon, I should have a full cycle, so I made a rare. And then I liked it so much, I turned it into a mechanic that increased poison and minus one, minus one counters. But then Mark Lobos, who was on the team, asked a very important question. He said, why can't it be all counters? To which I said, yeah, well, yes, it should be. So we changed it. Um, originally, it was called Accelerate. Obviously, it turned to be Proliferate. Um, we did it. It was very popular, so much so that we've done it in a whole bunch of other sets. Um, and usually, when we do Proliferate, we try to mix it up. So like War of the Spark, it was more about Planeswalkers. Phyrexia was more about oil counters. So we, we do like mixing up how you interact with the, with the uh, Proliferate. OK, question number 13. Which of the following mechanics was rated highest on the storm scale before its return in a premier set? Was it dice rolling? Was it madness? Was it meld? Or was it ninjutsu? Madness. And I heard one meld. OK, it's dice rolling. So let me explain. So on Blogatog, I have a thing called the storm scale, where I, I grade on a scale from 1 to 10 how likely something is to return to a premier set. 1 means, for sure, it's evergreen. It should be in most premier sets. And 10 means I highly, highly doubt it. Not impossible, but I highly doubt it. So Meld had a 6. Ninjutsu had a 7. Mostly because of the name. It's hard to put that mechanic in other places. Um, madness had an 8. But dice rolling had a 10. Why? Because at the time it was an unmechanic that we only did in unsets. And so I didn't think we were ever going to do it in a normal set. But then we made Dungeons and Dragons, the Adventures of the Forgotten Realm. And the D20 is such an important part of it that they decided to make cards where you roll D20s. Uh, and so that became something we just did in black bordered sets. So um, one day I assume we'll do more. I mean, Infinity did some eternal legal one, six, six sided cards. Okay, question number 14. Which Tempest card was play tested incorrectly from the design intent, and I designed it, uh, but not changed because R&D liked it? I would later remake the card with my intended design in Champions of Kamigawa. Was it Grindstone? Was it Humility? Was it Intuition? Or was it Scroll Rack? Scroll Rack? I, I did see, someone here said Intuition. It was Intuition. Um, so anyway, I made Intuition. And one day, I'm playing it with Mike Elliott, who is one of the designers on Tempest. Um, and so he goes and gets three copies of the same card. And I said, Mike, you have to get three different cards. They can't have the same, you can't be the same card. And he goes, that's not what it says. I go, I, whatever, Mike, it's my card. That's what it's supposed to do. And he's like, well, I, I like it this way. So I went to other members of R&D, and they, they're like, yeah, that seems cool. So they wouldn't change it. So intuition got printed the way it was. Um, so years later in Champs of Kamigawa, I made Gifts Ungiven and specifically made sure that it had different cards so that I can make my card. So now both intuition and Gifts Ungiven were very played, so both very popular cards. OK, question number 15. If you visited the, the Magic website in January of 2007, what card overtook the screen to preview Planar Chaos? Was it Damnation, Gaia's Anthem, Ovinize, Ovinize, or Pyrohemia? Damnation is correct. So um, Planar Chaos was coming out. The big shtick of Planar Chaos 
was that we had cards that were um, like alternate reality where we changed the color of the card. That was our bonus sheet. And so I, Damnation was the very first card I made for the bonus sheet, and I thought it was like the most, it really symbolized what the set was about. Because um, Planet of Chaos was all about alternate reality. It was the present, but alternate reality present. So what happened was when you came to the website, this is how it looks now, I couldn't find a picture of how it looked then, but you came to the website and then it went white. Everything just went to white. And then a giant wrath of God like filled up the whole screen. And then it turned black and turned into damnation and everything turned black. And it was a really cool thing. We don't, we, we haven't done anything like that in a long time. But anyway, that's, that's how we, like, the audience didn't know anything about Planet of Chaos and just one day that happened. So that was our first, like, teaser at, at uh, Planet of Chaos. Okay, question number 16. Which of the following creature types was the first one planned to be an Ixalan? Was it dinosaurs? Was it merfolk? Was it pirates? Or was it vampires? Pirates is what I heard. It was vampires. Okay, so Ixalan was a brainchild of a woman named Jenna Helland, who used to be in the creative team. She's not anymore, but for many years in the creative team. Um, and she came up with this idea of um, conquistador vampires. And so the idea is they show up and then it, it was a two-sided war between the natives of the world and the conquistador vampires. That was the original idea. Um, but when they pitched the idea to me and are like, we plot, out, we plot out things ahead of time, I said, you know guys, we've been doing a lot of two-sided conflicts. What if we added in a third side? What if there was a third person fighting? I think that would give more dynamic to it. And they said, fine. So they added pirates. So the pirates got added. Um, but then what happened was, so um, there's a game called Vampire the Eternal Struggle made by Richard Garfield. Uh, and in it, he made a thing called The Edge. And The Edge was a mechanic that players would fight over. So my idea was that we'd have three factions and they'd be fighting over a resource. That was my plan. But then uh, Sean Main, who was a uh, runner-up in the second Great Designer Search, uh, was making Conspiracy Take the Crown. So he said, we have this idea for a mechanic that's like the edge, could we do it? Obviously, it was uh, the Monarch. When I said, okay, Sean, here's what I want you to do. We'll start playtesting it for two-player play, you test it for multiplayer play, make a backup. If it turns out it's good for two-player play, we're gonna do it, and then you'll use your backup. That was the plan. So we started exploratory design early, we play tested with two player, and it was awesome. It worked really well. So I went to Sean and I said, okay, Sean, it works really well in two player, you're gonna need to use your backup. And Sean is like, I have no backup. And so um, we're like, okay. So Sean ended up uh, using the Monarch. So we had to come up with something brand new. Uh, and so I realized that the, um, that the, 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 um, Pirates were playing well, and there were, there were dinosaurs in the creative, and I'm like, well, maybe we can make it typo. So we added in the dinosaurs and said, okay, one of the factions will be dinosaurs. And then um, to flesh out the typo, I borrowed a structure I'd made for Cons of Tarkir. So before it was a wedge set, there were four factions in it before we added the fifth faction, and it was two three-color factions and two two-color factions. So I borrowed that model, but that meant we needed a fourth faction. And so we spent some time and worked with the creative team. So the last one added was the, the Merfolk. Merfolk were the last one they added. Uh, that's how we ended up with um, Ixalan. Okay, question number 17. What green Lorwyn card was originally in Future Sight, but got removed and replaced by Tarmogoyf? Was it Epic Proportions, Garrick Wildspeaker, Incremental Growth, or Lignify? It was Garrick, Garrick Wildspeaker. So here's what happened. We were making Future Sight. So Matt Cavada, who you guys might know as an artist, at the time he was working on the creative team, uh, Matt said, you know, we're doing the mending, we're doing this whole story to make the Planeswalkers depowered. We should have Planeswalkers, uh, Planeswalkers should be a card type. We should make Planeswalkers. And I said, I think you're right. So the plan originally was, we were gonna make three of them on the future, the future shifted sheet. Uh, so we were going to make blue, black, and green were the ones we chose. Uh, and so we actually um, play tested a bunch of things. This is my play test card. Um, Fendari was Garrick's original name. Um, and now we also made Tarmogoyf. The joke of Tarmogoyf was that it, in its reminder text, it referenced card types that didn't exist because it was from the future. 
Um, and we made it a Lurgoyf because we wanted to care about the graveyard, but care about card types in the graveyard. But anyway, the card got removed so that we could put Garrick in the set. Um, now, Mike Turin was the head developer of the set. So he realized, eventually we decided that the Planeswalkers weren't where we needed them to be, so we wanted to hold off on them, and we ended up pushing them back to Lorwyn. So there were three holes, one in blue, one in black, one in green. So for the green hole, Mike put Tarmogoyf back in the set. But two things. One, he, ch he did it from memory. Originally, it was two and a green for star, star. Uh, and he did it for one and a green, star, star plus one, because that's how Lorgoyf works. And he made, tar and Tarmogoyf went on to be a pretty powerful card. Okay, question number 18. Which unglued card was the inspiration for split cards? Was it BFM? Burning Cinder Fury of Crimson Chaos Fire? Free for All and I'm Rubber, You're Glue, the two that share art across them. Or Growth Spurt. BFM is correct. You guys got that one. Um, so BFM was the number one card in our market research, the most favorite card from Unglued. And I said, okay, well, if players really like a card so big that it fits on two cards, how about a card so small that two of them fit on one card? And so this is my, little, my original prototype. I call it a hit and run. Uh, you guys will know the card as Assault and Battery, but it, basically I had it, I was very close. Um, so I put it in Unglue 2, and then Unglue 2 got canceled. So when we made Invasion, I uh, pitched it to Bill Rose, who was the head designer of Invasion, and Bill liked it, so he put it in the set. So uh, when we started development, the people in favor of it were me and Bill, uh, and Richard Garfield wasn't working on Magic, but he did, he did like it. Uh, the people that were uh, against it was the rest of the company. <laughs> uh, so the story I always tell is the very first development meeting, the very first thing Henry Stern said, who was the lead developer, was, can we just kill these? Um, br the brand team told Bill we're never going to make them. Uh, R&D said we're never going to make them. Somehow Bill and I got from nobody wanting to do them to them seeing print. So. Uh, I, I, that's, uh, we worked very hard on that. And they came out, they were super popular. We've done them a whole bunch of different times in different places, in different ways. Okay, question number 19. What artifact card from original Innistrad block did we make cardboard copies of and send to stores? Was it Gallows at Willow Hill? Was it Graft Digger's Cage? Was it Grimoire of the Dead? Or was it Hell Vault? It was Hell Vault, yes. Um, so, the Hell Vault, uh, so for those that don't know the story of Avacyn Restored, uh, Avacyn got locked away in the Hell Vault. She was trying to uh, trap Bristlebrand, got trapped herself. Uh, and things went badly because she was away. Uh, and so Liliana, for her own personal reasons to get to Bristlebrand, broke open the Hell Vault, and Avacyn came out, and it turned the tide of everything, and Avacyn got restored, which is what the name of the set is. So we thought it'd be really cool if we sent every store that was you know, part of the our, our league, whatever, uh, a cardboard hell vault. And then you would play in the tournament and there were prizes in the hell vault. It opened up and there were prizes inside. Um, not the cat, but I thought it was a cute picture. Uh, but there were, there were like promos and things in it. Uh, but anyway, that was a promotion we did. Okay, question number 20. At what point in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty's design was the decision made to have it be set on Kamigawa? At the beginning of exploratory design, at the beginning of vision design, in the middle of vision design, in the middle of set design. It was in the middle of vision design. So here's what happened. Back in October of 2004, we made Champions of Kamigawa, and it did badly. It did very badly. It sold badly in market research. At the time, it was the worst set we'd ever done market research on. Um, so I never thought we were going to go back. Um, it was obviously, like I said before, based on Japanese mythology. It was a beautiful, beautiful set. It looked really nice, uh, but it wasn't very popular at the time. Um, so we had talked about doing a Japanese world inspired by pop culture. So not as much Japanese, more things that people might know because they'd grown up seeing the media. Um, but something that I knew, because I have a blog called Blogatog, is the number one request I got on my blog was returning to Kamigawa. So the challenge was, how do I do all the pop culture stuff, but also integrate this stuff? Like, I knew, so when we, when we started design, I said, okay, 
Let's not assume it's anything. Let's not assume it's Kamigawa. Let's just make the best set we can, and then we'll ask ourselves, could it be Kamigawa? But my secret agenda was to make a design where the only, it had to be Kamigawa. We couldn't have any other choice. Um, and so the idea we came up with was one of the things that's a, a theme that shows up in Japanese culture uh, and pop culture is the idea of modernity versus tradition, is the idea of the latest technology versus the, the past, history. And it ended up being a great way to have both parts, that we could take the new part and the old part, and it was the conflict between the two that defined the set. And so we made this world that lived in the combination of the two. Um, so I was very happy. The set did amazingly well. So that all worked out well. Okay, question number 21. Which Odyssey card was the original home for the art of Flame Burst? So let me show you Flame Burst. So this is the art of Flame Burst. This art was not made for Flame Burst. So also I want to make a little caveat. What I'm going to explain here is not the way we do art anymore. This is, if the art directors heard me talking about this, they would cringe. Back in the day, we would swap art around to, to better match things. Um, so this card, we said, this, this didn't seem right. So okay, so what, I shouldn't spoil my story yet. Which Odyssey card was the original home for the Art of Flame Burst? Was it Avon Smoke Weaver? Was it Cease Fire? Was it Sky Shooter? Or was it Tomb Fire? It was Avon Smoke Weaver. So Avon Smoke Weaver has protection from red. So originally, that was the art. But here was the problem. It doesn't look like it's surviving, like it, it looks like it was really being hurt by it. Um, and so we said, you know, it, it, we can't put it on the card. It doesn't sell, hey, I'm brushing off direct damage. It says like it hurts me more. Um, so if you looked at the card, so we said, okay, what can we do with it? We said, well, it kind of looks like a direct damage spell. So to lessen the, the focus on the creature, we flipped it upside down, and yes, we moved the artist signature. That's why they, we moved it to the right place. Um, but anyway, that's how we ended up with Flame Burst. That, that, that's how we got the card. Okay, question number 22. An enchantment-based Greek mythology set was a last-minute change for Theros. What was it originally? What, what did the block do originally? A block where we meet two worlds and they go to war in the third set? A block of three return worlds, each destroyed by the Phyrexians? A block on the same world where time jumps greatly between each set? Or a block where the main characters travel between three worlds? It was time jumps. So Theros, as you guys know, uh, had a Greek mythology theme. It was gods and heroes and monsters. It had a strong enchantment theme. But that's not how it started. Um, so what happened was... Originally, we were going to go to a prehistoric world where there were dinosaurs and cave people. I know that dinosaur cave people on Earth did not coexist, but we're, we're making our own world. They could coexist. Then we hopped ahead thousands of years, and now it's like the Dark Ages, and we see like a, the same world, but like in the Dark Ages. And then it's now the future. We hopped together more thousands of years. And so the idea was, oh, we get to see this world, but we get to see it through time. So Brady Dommermuth was the creative director at the time, and he was the one that said no. He goes, that's three worlds. We're designing three worlds. That's not one world. And at the time, the creative team was like five people. Like, now we have lots of art directors. We have, we've really, really beefed up the creative team by a lot. Um, now we can actually make three worlds, but we couldn't at the time. So um, uh, um, it was actually Brady that suggested that Theros be a Greek mythology world. Um, and he even pitched the idea of enchantments playing a role. Uh, and so we ended up making enchantments sort of the influence of the gods. And anyway, Theros worked out great. So that was Theros. Okay, question number 23. What set did I want to do so badly, I pushed for it for many years, and then was given two months in design to prove it was worth doing? Was it Innistrad, Ravnica, Throne of Eldraine, or Zendikar? Okay, I heard a lot of answers. It was Zendikar. So Ravnica, nobody tried to stop me from making Ravnica. Uh, the guild model was a little controversial. Uh, it, it, the, the development didn't know if we could develop it to make it a limited work, but Ravnica wasn't controversial. Both Innish Rider and Throne Eldraine took forever to, like Gothic Horror World took forever, Fairytale World took forever. Both those sets took a long time and I had to go through a lot to get them made. But the one that really took the longest and I was actually given a limit to design for it was Zendikar. 
So here's the story. Randy Bueller, you guys might know as the he did, uh, commentary, was my boss back in the day. And Randy used to do a thing called the five-year plan, where he would map out what sets were in each of the years. So one of the things I wanted to do was a set based on land mechanics. I realized that there, we hadn't done much with land. I thought there was a lot of things we could do with it. Um, so Randy put it in as the fifth year. Notice he put it in as the last year, but he did put it in into the schedule. Um, Bill didn't like it, didn't think it would work. So what Bill said to me, he goes, okay, here's what I'm gonna do, Mark. I'll give you two months. After two months, you're gonna show me the set. If I don't like it, we're not doing it. We're gonna do something else. So in those two months, I made 46 different land mechanics, my team and I, uh, and we ended up making a Landfall, which is awesome. Uh, and then I went back to Bill, we played with Landfall, uh, and Bill said, you're good to go, and we, we got to make Zendikar. Uh, but I, I, I literally had a two-month clock to prove it. Okay, question number 24. What Planeswalker character in Concept Arc here block was first introduced on a piece of flavor text, the only reference in the set? Was it Narset? Was it Sarkin? Was it Sorin? Was it Ugin? Who was it? Ugin. Okay, what card was it? Yes, it was. Uh, so Ugin the Dragon. It was in Future Sight. We made Ghostfire, which was uh, we hinted at what would become um, Devoid, um, and the idea was that not only did we hint at the mechanical future, we hinted at flavor future. So somebody actually wrote a piece of flavor text. I, I don't know who. Um, and the flavor text, none of these things were things at a time. Ugin didn't exist at the time. I have Ugin didn't exist at the time. Spirit dragons, I don't think we had made that. I mean, uh, Japanese mythology has spirit dragons, but I don't think we specifically put those in as, as spirit dragon. Um, but anyway, so uh, that one piece of flavor text introduced the character of Ugin, introduced the Eye of Ugin that had a major role in Zendikar, and introduced the spirit dragons that had a major role in Tarkir. So that one piece of flavor text, like infinite creative, came out of one person just making something up. Uh, and that, anyway, that, to me, that's a very cool story. Okay, question number 25. The Kaladesh development team removed a mechanic from the set. It would later evolve and become what mechanic? Lesson learn, mutate, reconfigure, or venture into the dungeon? Lesson learn. Okay, so mutate was evolved from, we had a mechanic in Lorman called champion that represented like creatures evolving. Uh, that's where mutate came from. Reconfigure came from Tempest and Lissids, which were um, creatures that turned into auras. I mean, Reconfigure did it with equipment, but same premise. Uh, Venture in the Dungeon was inspired by a mechanic called Skirmish that we made for War of the Spark that we didn't make it in the set, where you, you had an outside game that you brought into it, and that, um, I, I believe that uh, Jules, who made the mechanic, had, was on the team with me, and that inspired him to try to do... The thing was they were doing Dungeons and Dragons, and there were dragons in the set, because Magic has dragons, and he didn't know how to get the dungeons into the set. And so that was inspiration for Venture in the Dungeon. But Lesson Learn came from Kaladesh. So originally we had a mechanic called Inventions that was essentially Lesson Learn. You would cast cards that will get you an invention. Inventions were usually cheap artifacts that you could play in your deck, but if you had them in your sideboard, you could go get them into your hand. Um, and what we were told was energy and inventions were both complicated. We could do one or the other. So the development team said, what, what do you want to keep? I said, energy for sure. And so they removed inventions. Um, and then obviously in Strixhaven, we would do Lesson and Learn. Um, the Strixhaven team were aware that we had done it, and so it inspired it. It turns out it works better with instant sorceries than artifacts, by the way. Okay, question number 26. Which artifact card from Mirrodin was originally in Tempest as a card representing the Helm of Ulrath? Was it Chalice of the Void? Was it Krark's Thumb? Was it Mindslaver? Or was it Soul Foundry? It was Mindslaver. So um, in the story, uh, he had a Volrath, the bad guy, had a helm, um, and uh, he, there's pieces of art, he, he used it to take control of people. He could take over people. Um, and there's this idea I had at the time that I called the Mar is my marquee idea, based on um, Jester's Cat from Ice Age, that every set should have a card that was colorless using an artifact or a land that could go in any deck that did something that Magic had never done before. So for example, Grinning Totem was the one I made for Mirage. Um, so 
The idea was Helm of Volrath. What was more exciting than taking control of your opponent? That sounded really awesome to me. And so I pitched it, and then the rules manager at the time goes, there's no way we can do that. So we had to change it, and Helm of Possession came, became a different card. You stole creatures rather than players. Um, years later, I was making Mirrodin. We had a new uh, rules manager. So I was trying to come up with cool artifacts. So I said, hey, here's a cool idea. Could we do this? And they said, I don't see why not. So we did. <laughs> and so we made Mindslaver. Okay, next, question number 27. Sagas were inspired by an early design that had been abandoned of what mechanical element? Contraptions, double-faced cards, level up, or planeswalkers? Planeswalkers is correct. So in Future Sight, um, I talked about how um, we, had made, we were going to make the planeswalkers. Uh, so in the early version of them, here's how they worked. They had uh, three abilities. So turn one, they do the first ability. So Garrick would make a 3-3 beast. Turn two, they'd have another ability. Ooh, double all your beasts. So he'd double all his beasts. Turn three, he, oh, now all the beasts get, a, you know, get bigger and can attack and everything. Um, and then on the next turn, it would go back to the first turn. But the problem was, let's say at turn one, you made a beast and your opponent shocked it. Well, turn two, you go to copy your beast, but you don't have any beasts, so nothing happens. And turn three, all your beasts get bigger, but you don't have any beasts, so nothing happens. It just made them feel stupid. It made the planeswalkers feel like they, they were just dumb. And so we ended up sh shifting to the loyalty model that we know now. Um, but in Dominaria, we were trying to figure out how to make stories work. And I said, you know, while it makes players feel dumb, a story has a beginning, middle, and end. So that same progression that kind of worked against the Planeswalkers, I thought, made a lot of sense. And that was the way we started with Saga. I mean, we did a lot of tw tweaking to it, but that's where Saga started from. Okay, question number 28. Which of these Urza's legacy cards was printed with a mana cost other than what R&D intended? Memory Jar, No Mercy, Palancron, or Rancor? I hear Rancor, I hear Palancron. It is Rancor. Here is the story of Rancor. So we were playtesting Rancor. It cost one green mana, and we decided it was too good. So we changed it to one and a green mana. Okay, Urza's Legacy comes out, and I'm opening up packs, and I see this card. So I go to Bill, because uh, Bill, um, uh, Bill, Bill was the head designer at the time. I go, Bill, Rancor doesn't cost one mana. And Bill says something I will always remember. It does now. <laughs> Um, so we made, a, I mean, for years we weren't even supposed to talk about this. Finally they said whatever, it's, you know, uh, Ranker went on to be obviously a very powerful card, but not broken, so uh, it being one mana probably wasn't the end of the world, but we, it was not our intent. It was supposed to cost two mana, so. Uh, and that's the only time, by the way, that I know, other than, I mean, we've made mistakes where like, Cyclopean Tomb didn't have a mana cost on it, but it's the only time where it got printed in the wrong cost, we just said that's the wrong, that's the cost and we left it be. Alpha, we fixed, like, they were wrong costs and we fixed them, but. Okay, and Ranker went on, obviously, to be a popular card. Okay, question number 29. What Champions of Kamigawa legendary creature was designed by me in a meeting to prove somebody wrong? Was it Isamaru, Hound of Kanda? Was it Kiki Jiki, Mirror Breaker? Was it Maru Nar, Nar, Maru Nar, Nar? Or was it Uyo, Silent Prophet? It was Isamaru. Okay, so what happened is, um, in Champs of Kamigawa, all the rare creatures were legendary. Some of the uncommon creatures were legendary. And so we were having a, I don't know, a conversation about what makes a legendary creature. And somebody said, well, they can't be vanilla. And I go, why can't they be vanilla? They're like, you can't make an interesting vanilla legendary. So on the spot, I made, I, I, how about a W2-2? And they're like, oh, that's pretty cool. So we put it in the set. Um, and that, 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 the card just literally was me just proving it could be done. Years later, someone would say to me, well, you can't make a mythic rare lead, uh, vanilla creature. So I did. Um, <laughs> okay, question number 30, our final question. Of the following set names, which was the only one to be the original planned name of the expansion? Was it Khans of Tarkir? Was it Throne of Eldraine? Was it Urza Saga? Or was it War of the Spark? It was War of the Spark. 
Okay, does anybody know the original name of Khans of Tarkir? Warlords of Kanar was the original name. Um, I don't know. So the way, real quickly, the way naming works is the creative team comes up with a name. Uh, it gets run by a lot of people in the office. And then it goes to legal. And then legal has to, like, there's infinite things legal has to pass. So legal, like, creative uh, can like something. But if legal says no, we, we just can't do it. Uh, they don't tell us why. It's just legal said no. So Warlords of Kanar, why didn't we do it? Legal said no. I have no idea why. Um, so we changed it to Khans of Tarkir at that point. Okay. Throne of Eldraine was originally Throne of Ardenvale. And somebody high up didn't like the name. They just didn't. They, so, but the creative team liked the name. So we used it to be the White Castle. <laughs> um, and then we ended up just calling it Throne of Eldraine. Okay. Urza Saga, his original name, was Urza's Odyssey. Uh, and we really liked Urza's Odyssey. That was the name we wanted. Um, so, for those who don't know, the, the Urza block is a story of Urza and trying to solve the whole Weather Light Saga thing. Um, and so, anyway, we were told we couldn't use Urza's Odyssey. Um, now, years later, we made a set called Odyssey, of which I said, how in the world could we not call it that Urza's Odyssey? But Odyssey was fine. And the answer I got was different lawyers. So, uh, anyway, guys, I want to thank, thank you all for being here. Thanks for being at MagicCon. Um, this was how to reveal. So thank you guys very much. Okay.